Well, good morning, and uh, glad that you're here. It's good to see you. Most of you I know. Um, some I need to get to know better. And uh, thank you, musicians, for leading us this morning. I'll have some announcements at the end of the service, but uh, right now we want to move into our message, and I have the privilege of introducing the speaker this morning. And uh, there's a lot of things I could say. And uh, if you don't know, the speaker this morning is my younger brother. And uh, Jack comes to us as a, I'm going to call him retired. It's semi-retired. You never know. You never know. But uh, I'll give you a little background rather than you know, stories. Uh, Jack uh, grew up as I did in Holland, Michigan. Graduated from uh, West Ottawa High School. Any? Uh, no. Went on there to Western Michigan University. Anybody? No. And uh, worked a few years. Anybody work? Yeah. yeah. And uh, then went to uh, seminary in Grand Rapids and uh, met his wife there. Uh, just a little trivia there. His wife, Jane, was Jane Gavriloff. Some of you might remember Pete and Ev Gavriloff that attended here for a while. Jane would be their niece. So sometimes it's a small world. And uh, Jack uh, was part of a, a church plant, or not part, he pastored a church plant in uh, Canada, just outside Vancouver for s several years, then pastored on Vancouver Island in the uh, city of Victoria for a few years, and then for even more years, pastored last at uh, Grace Bible Church in Ann Arbor. And uh, he's been with us before, but some of you may not have heard him again. Jack, come on up. He's, um, he's been a blessing to me. I'm pleased that we've reached a stage in our life. It's too bad it's so late that now we have the opportunity to see each other more. We don't have to wait for holidays. And uh, so I get to speak to him, and he always challenges me. He, he can be hard on you. I just want to warn you. He, he, sometimes he asks the tough questions. And uh, he'll make you think and squirm a little bit, but it's done in love, right? Always. Always in love. Uh, Jack, bring us the word this morning. It is good to be with you today, and it's great to see additional changes here at your church. And I'm sure the changes are not only physical, but trust that you continue to progress and grow in your walk with Christ and in your love and care for each other as a community. It's been encouraging to watch your church change over the years. I go back as far as knowing uh, about your church when it was in its previous location and watched from uh, a short distance a lot of the transitions that you've been through and it's been very encouraging to watch. You understand that there are certainties in life, and I don't have a screen there. Did we used to have that? Oh, there it is. Great, great, great. There are certainties in life, and it doesn't take us very long in life to learn that one of the certainties in life is that everyone has problems. We're going to talk about problems this morning because most of us don't like them. Most of us don't like problems. But as we're going to see in 1 Peter this morning, and I encourage you to turn there, we'll be reading from chapter 1 in just a moment. The certainty is that everyone has problems. You won't believe what happened to me this morning. We got on the road early this morning from Ann Arbor. I wasn't just a few minutes down the road, and a bug hit my windshield right in my line of sight. Right in my line of sight. Now, what do you do with that? How many of you would say that would be annoying, and I would pull over and clean that immediately? How many of you would do that? Most of you would say just ignore it, or... Put your windshield wiper on and let the fin it didn't clean it off. Everyone has problems. Everyone. 
The other certainty is that problems are relative. On a scale of one to 10, a bug on a windshield, two, on a scale of one to 10. You know, in the medical field, they've learned that if you ever go into the ER or to the urgent care or go see your doctor, you mention that you're having some pain or some difficulty. They say, well, on a scale of one to 10, how, how painful is it? And if you say 10, you're apt to get a little faster response than if you say a two. The problems are relative. They vary in their severity. We're experiencing problems in our culture these days, aren't we? And it's been trying. And it's affecting people at different levels. You have problems in your life this morning, no doubt. And one of the things I've often done over the years when people would come to see me and share their problem, their difficulty, I would ask them and say, now on a scale of one to 10, how critical is this? Now with a married couple, if she said nine and he said two, we, we got more than one problem. Everybody has problems. Problems are relative. Peter is writing to people with some very severe problems that we're going to talk about this morning. And follow with me in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil, never fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, in this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come, these trials, they've come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, gold which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you've not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. Father in heaven, we ask today that you would speak to us through your word. In spite of the frailty and the ineptitude of the messenger, would your spirit bring these truths to bear upon each life here and those viewing as well. We pray you'd give us understanding that would translate into us being more conformed to your likeness and your image. 
For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Peter is writing to a very specific and unique group of people. I thought a great deal this week about what it would be like 20 years from today for a a young teen or another person to read some of the history or an account or, if you would, a letter from a grandparent that was about the year 2020. There might be mention of the fact that we couldn't have had a graduation event. We had to postpone a wedding. We had a a memorial service for someone that, oh no, we, we we couldn't have that in 2020. About what it was like to have school at home or online what impact transpired in our church when we, we had far more space in our, our auditorium at Emmanuel Bible Church in Saginaw, but we, well, we had two services because we had to social distance. If someone didn't understand that there was a pandemic that took place in 2020, They wouldn't understand all that's transpired and has changed in our lives in the past several months. So too, the recipients that Peter is writing to, if we don't understand what was transpiring in their culture, we can't fully grasp the significance of his letter. Let me explain to you that Peter's letter was written, verse 2, to God's chosen ones, Verse 1, to God's elect who were strangers and who were scattered throughout all these different places. His recipients were mostly Gentiles, and he's writing to bring hope and strength and encouragement to them because they were experiencing persecution. I know some of you have felt like we've been persecuted lately. (laughs) But all problems are relative. For the first three decades of the church's existence, the church was protected. Wasn't persecuted by the Roman Empire. Christianity was seen as a Jewish sect and was recognized as a legitimate religion. All of that changed July 19, 64 AD. That's a very significant date in history because on that day, Rome caught fire. The destruction was severe. The city burned out of control for three days and three nights. We've watched even this week the effect of a hurricane on parts of our country. The devastation, so significant, hard to watch. Ancient temples, historic landmarks, homes were all destroyed. 10 of the 14 wards or districts in the city suffered damage and were reduced to rubble. Understandably, the citizens of Rome were upset. They were angry because it was widely sensed that Nero, the emperor, was the one responsible for the fire. He did nothing to contain the fire. So you, like me, would ask, why would the emperor intentionally start the fire? Why would he do that? Because in that day and at that time, kings loved, loved to build. They loved to kill They love to build. And by destroying so much of the city, 
that gave him the freedom to rebuild. He could do now with parks and wider streets and buildings constructed the way he wanted them. But it created a fair bit of turmoil beyond what we could imagine. Just like when we see pictures on the news of the hurricane's impact, houses destroyed, when it's not your house, when you don't physically see it. Well, it created a political problem. Not that we have any sense for political problems these days, but Nero did what most politicians have a propensity to do. He created a scapegoat. He blamed someone else. He didn't take responsibility for his actions. And guess who he blamed? He blamed the Christians. In so doing, he introduced the church to martyrdom, and the persecution that began in Rome spread across the entire empire. It's hard to imagine just what it was like, but here are some historical descriptions, almost too graphic to read. Just to imagine what was taking place. Everyone has problems. Problems are relative. And I don't like problems. Nero made a spectacle of Christians. It looked like they deserved what they got. But they weren't responsible. But it was brutal. Brutal. Innocent lives taken. And yet, here's the key verse for Peter's letter. His encouragement to those who had literally run for their lives, left everything, their homes, their possessions, their futures, their land, and scattered and couldn't even go together because if they congregated together, they were more easily found. And Peter writes to them and says that the God of all grace, in time, in time. The purpose of this little letter is encouragement and hope, and that's my intent this morning. Even though we don't like problems, God is still sovereign, even over a pandemic. Knowing what's transpired in their world, verse 1 makes even more sense, does it not? Strangers. Wherever they go now, they're despised. They're vulnerable. They can't get work because they're viewed as the ones to blame for what's happened. In spite of... We need to look at what Peter has to say to them because we face problems. Peter says, verse 1, to God's elect and strangers, grace and peace, verse 2, be yours in abundance. And verse 3, give praise, give praise for your new life. Now there are some people who have erroneously thought that by becoming a Christian, my life would get better. By becoming a Christian, my life would get better. These people had chosen to follow Christ, and did their life get better? Well, outwardly, monetarily, materially, 
No, it got worse. How is it that Peter could say, praise be for your new life? That's why, your new life. Now, I must confess, there are times, and there may be seasons in our lives, where it's much easier to complain than to give praise. I know you'll find this hard to believe, but early on my drive this morning, I didn't look over at my wife and say, praise be to God, I got a, I got a bug on the windshield and I can't see as well as I want to. I, I, that wasn't my first thought. And these days, if you listen to any news whatsoever, it can be hard not to complain. Do you know how complaining benefits your life and mine? Do you know how it benefits your life? Not very much, does it? Praise lifts our vision, lifts our focus towards higher, more important things. It's like receiving a gift and Peter wants them to know you receive a gift, you understand the gift, and then you use it. You receive new life, you understand that new life, and then you live it. Even in the midst of problems? Yes. It's much easier when things are going well. And I prefer things to go well. I like people to do what I want them to do. I like the world to be the way I would like it. Peter says, praise for your new life and understand that new life. Understand it. All of verse 3 and following are all about understanding what God has given us in Christ. He has given us new birth and a living hope. Not hope just for after this life. Hope now, in the midst of. We receive a gift. We understand the gift. And then we need to live in accordance with that. Here's five things to know. Please mark these down and remember these if you ever have any problems. Five things we need to know about living, about living. And the first is that we have a living hope. A living hope. Our world is filled with tension. Tension is part of life. The tension is, that's what the future holds. This is what I experience in the present. There's a tension there. When our children are young, we, we have visions of where they're going to be in a few years. No more diapers, Lord, please. No more diapers. No more this, no more sleeping through the night. Yes, all those things, right? And we live with that tension because we know, we have confidence, the future will be better. Our future is secure, but our present is filled with tension. The good news is we have a living hope because Jesus is alive. We have a living hope because Jesus rose from the dead. He arose. We also have an inheritance. We have an inheritance. What's our inheritance like? Peter wants them to know that verse 4, 
but they have an inheritance that can never perish. It doesn't matter what happens. Now, physically, it's feasible for a child to pass away before the parent. Unfortunately, it happens. And never receive the inheritance that the parents may have planned or intended. That is not the case with Christ. Our inheritance can never perish. It never spoils. It can't fade. It is being kept. It is being protected well beyond our access today. But it is there and it is secure. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? I had a discussion some years ago with a financial planner. And the question was about retirement. And all financial planners will ask you this. They'll say, well, how much, how much do you want to have in retirement? How much will it take for you to feel secure? And whatever amount you say, they're apt to say what? I think you might want a little more. I think you might want a little more. So if a million dollars of assets or liquidity is what you think would be sufficient, well, I don't know, you never know what could happen in five or ten years. You might want to plan on more. Let me ask you this morning, how much, how much money does it take to feel secure? How much does it take? Well, it, you know, boy, if I won $10 million in the lottery, man, I'd feel, well, no, wait a minute. If I won $10 million in the lottery, by the time they tax that thing, then I've only got $5 million, keyword only. And by the time I pay off my mortgage and I get a couple things, and, you know, then I, man, by the time it, I might only have a couple of million to invest or save. How much is enough? How much to make you feel secure? There is, there is no way that something that's temporary can really give us security. Peter wants them to feel secure. They have a living hope. They have a sure and certain inheritance. And verse 5 allows them to know that you are protected. Through faith, you're shielded by God's power. How much power does God have? Beyond our comprehension, then he has enough to protect you. He has enough to protect you. You say, wait a minute, I know people who've been in car accidents, they weren't protected. That's not what this means. This means that God has promised to protect us to make sure that we receive our inheritance. It doesn't mean we'll never have problems. It doesn't mean we might not have an accident or a health issue, but we are sure to receive our inheritance. That's protected, and I am guaranteed. He that began a good work in you will what? He'll complete it. And he has the ability to do that. So know, be assured, that you can rejoice in your trials. Didn't James talk about that? James said, consider it all joy. I'm more apt to complain. I don't, I don't always consider problems joyful. Let, let me... Let me assure you that verse 6 is not a misprint. It does say, in this you greatly rejoice. Now, 
you Bible nerds. Let me tell you, there are two options here. One is that in this you greatly rejoice could be referring to the previous verse and our inheritance and our protection, and in that we rejoice. Or it could be referring to, though now for a little while, you may have to suffer grief. You want to take it back or you want to take it forward? I'll, I'll give you the freedom and I won't be dogmatic about either one because I don't think it's overly clear. But I think both are true. Let me make a distinction for you, though, that we're to rejoice not for trials, but in trials. You, you get the difference? In other words, when something happens in our lives and a major problem, we don't say, oh, yay, I'm so happy for this. No, I'm not, I'm not happy for it. I'm not joyful for it but I can be joyful in it and through it. And there's a difference, right? That's why James would affirm the same truth when he says, consider it pure joy when you encounter various trials of all kinds. Let's talk about some things to know as Peter continues. First, understand that trials are temporary. Problems are temporary. I love problems that are easily and quickly remedied, don't you? You know, stuff that's easily fixed. Well, I haven't yet, but before I leave here this morning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a cloth or a towel or something, and I'm going to clean off my windshield. And I've had to endure that now for, you know, such a long time. I'm going to fix it. Verse 6 says, now for how long? A little while. How long's a little while? How, long's, how many of you ever had a migraine? Anybody here ever had a migraine? Yeah. How long's a little while to have a migraine? Six months along, is that a little while? A little while? We have, we have a good friend who has, on a scale of one to ten, about a seven or an eight migraine every day. Every day. Is that a little while? How long have we had this pandemic? A little while? How long is a little while? Depends how big the problem is, right? My brother-in-law has bone on bone in his hip. He's taking the maximum amount of morphine allowed and has episodes during the course of a normal day where he lays down and cries because the pain is so intense. And he's, he's on the waiting list for surgery. COVID hasn't helped because surgeries are backed up. How long is a little while? You want to tell him it won't be, it won't be much longer, Brian. It won't, it won't be long, just a little while. I know that as I get older and I look back on time, five years looking back is a lot shorter than when I was in my 20s and looking ahead five years. It's a lot shorter, a lot shorter. Trials are temporary and if you're in the midst of one today, God knows 
And his timing is always perfect. And he wants you to know that he knows. Second thing we need to know is the value of your faith. The value of your faith. I love verse 7. I love verse 7. These trials have come, these difficulties, these problems. These are people who have lost everything, have seen friends and family members slaughtered and martyred. Life's tough. And Peter says these have come so that your faith of greater worth than what? Now, I tell you, gold was valuable then. I'll tell you, I wished I owned gold today. It's almost $2,000 an ounce. Pretty valuable, right? Not to be compared with the value of your faith. The fire that burns away the impurities in the metal and reveals the purity of it also works in you to reveal the quality and the genuineness of our faith. And our faith does need refining. It needs it today. It will need it tomorrow. It will need it 20 years from now. Our faith needs refining. And all of this, all of this results in praise, honor, and glory to God. It's not about me. It's all about him. That's the result. That's the goal. Consequently, I must move along and hurry up and give you three affirmations. These are so important for us to affirm the truth, to affirm the truth, to affirm the truth day after day after day, even when it's difficult, even when the trials seem overwhelming. Though you haven't seen him, verse 8, just affirm, you love him. You love him. I must confess there have been days when my wife and I have had conflict. Most of the time, it's clear whose fault it is. But, I mean, what good does it do to blame your wife? Because that, that's not going to get you very far. When we have conflict, I need to affirm, I love you. I don't want to have conflict. I don't want to have conflict. Peter says, you love him. Oh, and know that he loves you. Know that he loves you. You love him. You believe in him. You have confidence. Even though you don't see him now, you believe in him. And you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Even in the midst of a pandemic, even when we have all these limitations and we see people being hospitalized and succumbing to this disease around us. You have confidence. You trust him. And you're filled with joy. Why do we say we love him? Why do we affirm we believe in him? Why are we filled with joy? Because of who Jesus is and because of what he has done and what he is doing. The ultimate isn't now. We haven't received our salvation in full. We're living in this tension between what it's going to be and where we are today. Having this perspective keeps things in their rightful place. Interesting that this section concludes with Peter reminding them that the prophets predicted all this. They saw it coming. They talked about Jesus, the Messiah, coming. They talked about these things. 
I, lo I love I love the way it, they they never got to see it, right? The prophets never got to see it. You do. And he says even even angels long. Even angels long to look into these things. This longing, this verb here is, is an, an active straining, straining to see. Let me share with you something that is a good reminder for all of us. Suffering comes before, before the glory, eh? What happened to Jesus before he was received at the Father's right hand? What had to happen? Yeah, he had to go to the cross. Let me ask you, are we living in a time of suffering or are we living in the time of the ultimate glory? If you think this is the ultimate time of glory, you are mistaken. <laughs> Imagine the circumstances these people were experiencing. It was not a time of glory. It was tough. It was overwhelming. Suffering always precedes glory. What helps us through is looking ahead. We need to look Ahead. By the way, if you, any of you aspiring authors want a good title for a book, I'll give it to you from this. The Joy of Suffering. <laughs> I bet that'd be a bestseller, right? The Joy of Suffering. Because everybody wants to suffer, right? But I, I, no, Jack, I don't like problems. I don't like problems. I don't like little problems. I don't like big problems. Is your faith genuine today? The way we learn about the genuineness of our faith is through what? Tiptoeing through the tulips. Life being easy. The way we determine the genuineness of our commitments to our spouse or to our children is through what? Oh, you get the baby home and boy, two o'clock in the morning the baby cries and you say, I'm not sure I like this. Take care of yourself. I didn't sign up for this. No, oh, the the genuineness of your commitment is demonstrated through difficulty. It's easy to quit. It's easy to give up. Is your faith genuine today? Is, is, is it being tested right now? Any trials? Making you wonder if I just want to throw it, throw in the towel and give up. I heard a statistic recently that as a result of the pandemic, the percentage of millennials who have contemplated suicide within the past 30 days is like 25 or 30 percent. And yet, how severe of a trial has this been? Anybody here had your home burned down? I pray not. These people, they, most of them, their homes have been burned. Lost their jobs. Lost their jobs. They couldn't get, 
They lost everything. And they were being literally martyred and killed and savagely beaten for their faith. All problems are relative. Some days I have to stop and remind myself, this COVID thing hasn't been that bad. It hasn't been that bad. Inconvenient? Yes. Horrific and life-threatening? I'm here. <laughs> You're here. And I got here in a car with an insect blur on my windshield. And I still made it. I trust that we can rejoice today, not because of the trial, but in it. Because we know that he is ever faithful. He will see us through. He has prepared an inheritance for us beyond our comprehension. And he loves us and cares for us. Father in heaven, we thank you this morning that you love us and care for us more than we can understand. And I pray that in the midst of our struggles, large or small, that we would understand that we have a Savior, one who has gone before us, despising the shame, endured the cross, to set us free. Thank you that in the process of life, our faith needs refining. And I pray that we would be able to sing with joy and gratitude and affirm and praise you today for your goodness and your mercy and your faithfulness, your loving kindness. Thank you that we also can encourage one another. And thank you for the community here at Emmanuel that sustains and strengthens one another. May it continue and may it be evidence of the grace of God in this community and have an impact in places well beyond our midst. We'll praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, well, thank you, Jack. I, um, it was kind of special to me this morning, not only because he's my brother, but I've been memorizing First Peter, and so I've been meditating upon a lot of this, but you've added to my meditation, so I appreciate that. I have a request to make of all of you, and it's this. I remember a time years ago when I, at the end of a message, everyone would get up to leave, and I would just sit in my seat, just kind of mulling over what I had just heard. And uh, I want you to promise me that as I kind of break the, the somberness of the message with some announcements, that you'll bounce back in your minds and think about it as you go through the rest of your day and maybe even go so far as to go back and read 1 Peter chapter 1. Um, I noticed this past week that in that chapter, I believe it's about 30 times, Peter uses the word you or yourselves or your. And so it's a very personal letter. And you might look at that. I probably need to speak up. I hear a little feedback. Let me give you just a few announcements, though, because they are important. Uh, next Sunday, uh, September 6th, uh, Amber and Matt, that'll be their last Sunday with us. And um, there's going to be just a time of uh, some coffee and, and uh, donuts or cupcakes after this early service and also after the latter service. And they'll be there with their children, and that'll be our opportunity to, uh, to say goodbye to Matt and Amber. And then on October the 5th, the first Monday in, in October, uh, it's usually the first Monday of each month, the women to women meet, and uh, that's open to all women, high school age and older. 
And uh, if you'd like to participate in that, you can either uh, sign up on the website, you can let uh, Kathy Luter or uh, Jamie Kinzer know, or you can sign up back at the information booth. And then uh, this is, not, I was not aware of this, on uh, Saturday, September 19th, uh, Global Serve International with uh, Julie Allen, Julie, uh, Greg Allen are missionaries of ours. Um, Julianne and Rick Davis of Engage Global will be sharing about their needs and, uh, and where they work. That's a Saturday and you'll probably get more information on that. And uh, if, you, if you want it earlier, you can get it from uh, Grant Schutte. And then uh, last, uh, well not quite last, starting in September, there's an Explorers Bible study will be hosted here at the church Thursday mornings and evenings and uh, you'll have more information that on the IBC website. And then continue to remember uh, Camp Barakel. We uh, had the privilege of, uh, Phil Luter and I had the privilege of uh, piling a trailer full of uh, woodworking tools and delivering it to them to uh, restock their, uh, their maintenance uh, up there and so they're going to be maybe better off, maybe blessed with a fire to have a better wood shop than they had before. So we praise God for that and you can continue giving. We've reached about half of our goal for the gift that we want to give to them. I received a message late last night that um, Pastor and, and, uh, and Lynn have finished their trip. They're on their way back and uh, hoping that we would have a good time together this morning as we meet together. And then uh, one more thing, I have it on, this is it's a smartphone is a misnomer. I want you to know that. I want you to know that that's a misnomer because it doesn't always do what I want it to do. What I have here, um, birthdays and um, yeah, can I find it? I think I can. Birthdays and anniversaries. It's not there. Paper, my brother. Oh, thank you. You're smarter than this phone. <laughs> Birthdays this week. Martin Kate Kowicki, nine years. I don't know if we announced that. I think so and Josh and Casey Winterstein, just two anniversaries this, this week. Lots of birthdays, Martin Cabaliza, Nick Greenwood, Mike Marshall, Rich Chislia, Lily Hubbard, Larry Curran, and Elizabeth Schwanicke. I think that's all. Thank you for being here this morning. It's an encouragement to see you out there. I've been encouraged this morning by the message, and again, you do me a the, the favor of returning your minds back to First Peter and uh, rejoicing in what God has done and what he will do and what he's doing today. Let me pray with you and you'll be dismissed. Father, we need encouragement just as they needed encouragement. Many times we read of apostles uh, and others circling back to the churches to encourage them in their faith. So I pray that we've been encouraged this morning. Help us not to take our eyes off of you and off of your son and what you've done for us and are doing for us and will do for us. And, uh, and set our, our minds fully on the grace that will be brought to us on the day of his revelation. Father, I pray this week that we would carry some of these thoughts with us. Encourage those who are enduring um, on a scale of one to ten, nines and tens, and uh, encourage all of us to live in light of what we already possess. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Dismissed.